Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this UK Reproducibility Network uh, workshop uh, on total quality management in academia. Um, this is being recorded, so um, I hope that is uh, okay for everybody. But if you'd rather not be seen on the recording, please do um, close off your video. Uh, the speakers that we have today are all going to be speaking on the topic of how we can ensure the quality of the research outputs that we generate. The motivation for this in part stems from an article in Nature Biotech um, several years ago now that drew an analogy between academic research and manufacturing. It's not a perfect analogy, but one of the uh, insights that the statistician W. Edwards Deming took to the Japanese automobile industry in the 1970s was that if you focus on ensuring the quality of the process, then the outputs can um, effectively look after themselves. And not only does that approach improve the quality of outputs, but because you're not expending resource on fixing problems that emerge later, you um, you also improve productivity. So if the analogy holds by focusing on the research process and introducing quality processes into, uh, into that way of thinking, then we can improve the quality of the academic research outputs that we generate, and we can improve our productivity in the sense of that knowledge more rapidly uh, translating into theoretical advances, societal benefit, or whatever may, may be the, the end state, if you like, that uh, flows from that research activity. So it's a very interesting area and one where we can potentially learn from other sectors. And so we have uh, four speakers. Fiona Booth will talk about quality assurance in the pharmaceutical industry. Mark Kelson will talk about a pilot uh, that they're setting up um, at his institution, the University of Exeter, on spot checks for reproducibility in a university setting. Uh, then after the break, Rennie Baikova will talk about pre-submission certification of computational reproducibility. And Daniel Baker will talk about Reproduce Me, a pilot project on computational reproducibility. Each talk will be about 20 minutes long. Uh, there won't be questions after each talk. Instead, at, um, at the end of those four talks at 20 to 3 UK time, we'll have a Q&A panel for about 20 minutes where we can field questions from um, anyone in the audience to all of the speakers. And if you'd like to put a question into the chat as we're going along, please feel free to do so. And when we come to the Q&A, you can either again put a question into the chat or you can put your hand up and I will try to come to you. And um, so the aim of today is really to explore what might be possible in a university setting, what different approaches are being piloted and what we can learn from other sectors. We need to remember that obviously academia is academia. We don't want to turn academia into the pharmaceutical industry, for example, in terms of how they do things, but perhaps there are things that we can learn from that industry and other sectors when it comes to how we can update, modernize, improve our own ways of working. So some of what we will uh, hear might be somewhat provocative or, um, uh, or novel in its approach, but I think that's an, a healthy thing, an exciting thing. And it's worth saying that there are several UKRN institutions that are collaborating on related pilots, which is to some extent creating a natural experiment that will help us to understand what works, how different approaches land when it comes to different research communities, and the extent to which different approaches are or are not portable across different disciplines and different ways of working. But the overriding principle of this is again, that if we can focus on the process of how we do research and interrogate steps in that process, including intermediate research outputs like data and code, and ensure that those are working as we intend them to, then we should be able to generate higher quality end outputs like journal articles, for example, as a result of that focus. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And I think um, that there will be some really uh, provocative questions that come out at the end, hopefully, that we will then uh, be able to um, knit together into uh, into a kind of narrative that brings together the uh, the different talks. So I think that's enough of an introduction. You'll see a few housekeeping notes in the chat. Um, unfortunately, today, uh, Will Gaunt, our administrator, isn't able to join us. So Neil Jacobs and myself are, uh, are trying to run the show. Um, so you may not get quite the same level of customer service as you might be used to on these workshops, but, uh, but we'll do our best. So um, this is going to be a slightly more amateur affair than usual, but uh, I think the content will be excellent, which is the thing that people come for. So on that note, no one came to hear me talking, and I'll hand straight over to our first speaker, Fiona Booth. Thank you very much, Marcus. Can I just check that you can see my slides, please? Thank you. you. See them, but they're in edit mode rather than present. Yeah, it's just catching up, I think. Here we go. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so my background is pharma quality assurance. I've also worked in pharma clinical trials um, for more than 20 years. 
Uh, I came to Bristol University last month uh, in a new role to lead a data integrity and quality assurance program in the Faculty of Life Sciences. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is directly related to pharma development. Um, I've spent more time in clinical research than I have in manufacturing, so my experiences relate more to the, the clinical side of things. Um, but what I want to present to you today is a very brief overview of quality assurance in pharma um, with a, an eye to how it could be applied in an academic setting. So like many safety regulations, quality assurance in pharma has evolved in a reactive way uh, following incidents where serious harm has been caused to patients through medicines that were faulty in some way. So in the last 20 years, there's been a drive to create a quality management systems in pharma, which are more targeted towards specific quality outcomes. So between manufacturing, laboratory work and clinical research it is a very vast topic. Um, so what I'm going to give you today is a very high level overview. So firstly, what do we mean by quality assurance and what do we mean by quality control? So if we take quality, quality control first, um, in the pharmaceutical development sector, we have laboratories, we have manufacturing sites, we have clinical research facilities, and now these days a whole host of IT systems. Um, within pharma, we put a very structured process around everything we do. Um, and then once that process has run, we wrap around quality control checks. So for each stage of a development process, whether it's in a lab or in a clinic, uh, we have a whole host of quality checks to make sure that the process has met a very specific criteria. And these almost always involve completing some kind of checklist. Now, across the life cycle of a pharma development project, there will be thousands of quality control checks, and they will involve a very broad spectrum of people, facilities, equipment, and IT systems. And quality control checks are very good at detecting defects when the checks are done correctly, but they're often very time consuming, they're resource intensive, and they do require specially trained personnel to conduct them. Thinking about quality assurance, Quality assurance is a more holistic approach to quality, and it's how we oversee the whole quality system. And a quality system sets out the standards that you're working to, how you're going to meet them, and how you and, and what people, actions, and documents are needed uh, in order to make sure that work is carried out in a consistent manner. Quality assurance activities check that the quality system is fit for purpose, and it's being applied correctly and consistently. And as part of quality assurance, there will be a sampling of the QC activities to make sure that the QC checks that are done are appropriate and are picking up the right kind of defects. But the advent of new technologies has introduced a lot more challenges to data quality. So advances in biomedical research and information technology have made it possible to study diseases and the treatments on a scale that we couldn't have imagined 30 years ago. But with these innovations, there's come a huge increase in complexity and a corresponding increase in the risks to data governance. Pharma quality systems across the spectrum of development have needed to adapt as re the research landscape has, involved, has evolved. Traditional methods for monitoring quality in large complex research studies are no longer fit for purpose or appropriate. We have laboratories that now offer a plethora of analytical services which were not previously available on the large scale. We have biotechnology products which were considered very niche 20 years ago, now in mainstream use. And the clinical research environment has been enriched or bedeviled, depending on your perspective, with new technologies which allow us to capture ever more clinical data. This quote here uh, from Janet Woodcock was made in 2005, um, and it describes a maximally efficient, agile, flexible pharmaceutical manufacturing sector that reliably produces high quality drugs without extensive regulatory oversight. Well, 18 years on from this, I don't think we've reached this optimal state with the possible exception of certain COVID vaccine programs, but we are making progress. And that's because we've had some fundamental shifts in the paradigms for research. Previously, perfection was always the goal. We wanted to present a perfect dossier to a medicines regulator um, who would look at that perfect dossier and agree that our drug was safe and effective. But perfection is unachievable, and in fact, it's actually undesirable in biomedical research. 
There are too many variables to control, too many processes which rely on human intervention, and often too few resources uh, to allow us to conduct the perfect trial. And in my career, I've only ever been involved in one study which came close to perfection. We had a really highly experienced and motivated research team. We had a very engaged patient population uh, and actually thankfully adequate resources. And with our robust and largely complete data set, we were able to prove unequivocally that the drug didn't work. So it was a success in a scientific sense, if not a commercial sense. But this scenario is not typical and trials in early development offer and end up with investigators and study sponsors scratching their heads over the results. When any research study fails to deliver the desired results, there are inevitably questions over the quality of the data. The company has to decide if the drug is really not behaving as they thought it was going to, or if there are methodological or process issues uh, which have compounded the results. And the World Health Organization succinctly summarized these uh, in a paper that came out in 2021. Um, the issues facing uh, pharma when they conduct uh, research and development in the modern age are compounded by these six areas of error. And we cannot afford to ignore these risks and we should actually be anticipating these risks and controlling for them. So perfect quality is not a realistic goal. And I think the COVID pandemic taught us that actually it's not necessary. Pharma and regulators were able to produce vaccines and approve them in timescales, which were unthinkable prior to 2020. And the regulators have now made the same kind of accelerated assessments available uh, to other indications as well. And for medicines, research regulators do not expect perfection from pharma. What they expect is openness. They want to know what the risks to quality are and how the company is controlling these. And over the last 20 years, quality risk management has become embedded in pharma development. The manufacturing sector was an early adopter and clinical research has been playing catch up, but it's now mandated in regulatory requirements that every clinical trial must have a risk management approach. Quality risk management was first introduced as a requirement in manufacturing in 2005, and it's been continually evolving ever since. And quality risk management focuses on developing a deep understanding of the risks to safety and quality and designing quality measures around those risks. Now, our primary interest uh, when it comes to data integrity uh, is how complete, consistent, accurate, trustworthy and reliable the data is. And importantly, that has to be throughout the whole data life cycle. Quality risk management approaches mean looking after the data, which is most important to the outcome of the research. And in a clinical trial, these will usually be the primary safety and efficacy measures. We need to have a deep understanding of the data we analyze to, in, in order to assess these measures. And to do that, we need to map out the data from the point of generation to the point of analysis and we can then assess the risks to its integrity. Traditional pharma quality assurance involves examining the causes of quality defects and investigating the root cause of those defects. Quality risk management turns this process on, it head, on its head by having a more proactive approach, firstly to anticipate what the root causes of quality defects could be, and then building risk mitigations in to prevent those from happening. This can be illustrated by looking at a really relatively simplistic example. Let's say we've got a promising new compound in development, but prior studies have suggested that it may have some undesirable effects on liver function. So it's really important that we investigate these in our target population before we proceed any further. And we need to conduct a very tightly controlled study in humans uh, to measure the effects on liver function. So taking a quality by design approach, we're going to first going to identify our critical data, and in this case, it will be the liver function tests. We then need to identify things that could negatively impact these and manage those risks. And finally, we know that perfection is not achievable, so we'll need to work out how much data we can afford to lose and still get a, ro a robust result. And this is called our quality tolerance limit. And having identified that our liver tests are critical data, we need to map out this data. Again, this is a little simplistic, but we can identify the following key activities in the life cycle of this data. To create a data flow map, we need to map out the data from the point of creation, when the sample is drawn from the patient in the clinic, 
through to the, each stage of processing, storage, transit and analysis. And in steps one to seven of this chart, our critical data is in the physical state. It's the sample itself with a digital identifier. Once the sample is analysed, the critical data exists only in digital form. The data will be transferred to the pharma company, where it will be analysed, reported and eventually archived. Now, having mapped out this data flow, we can now assess it for risks. Our lab partner in the study informs us that the biggest loss of data in their experience is due to samples which arrive at the lab in a hemolyzed state. So our liver function tests are our critical sample. So we need to make sure that the, the samples that reach the laboratory are in the optimal state and are fit for analysis. So our medical specialists are consulted and they inform us that from previous studies that we've done, the biggest cause of hemolyzed samples is using too small a gauge of needle to draw the sample and an incorrect technique. And now we know this, we can design some controls around these list risks. We can use various different quality, quality risk management proformers. And uh, this is a very simple, simple one. Um, we need to determine, firstly, how likely hemolysis is to occur, and if we can detect it and what the impact will be. Now, our lab partner in this scenario informs us that the incidence can be as high as 20%. So it's very likely that we will encounter a significant number of hemolyzed samples. It's easy to detect by a simple visual examination. And we know from what our statistician has told us that the impact will be very high. Our statistician informs us that if we do lose 20% of our samples due to hemolysis, we won't have a robust data set. He says we need to keep our data loss to below 10%. So knowing this, we can create a risk management plan with measures to make sure that the correct needle is used. Some well-meaning research nurses uh, may substitute the needle in our pack with a smaller gauge one because it's more comfortable for the patient. However, they don't realize that by doing that, it could render the sample unusable. We also need to make sure that our research staff are trained in how to draw the blood in such a way that we won't damage the red blood cells uh, if it's drawn too quickly. And we will communicate the reasons to this very clearly to our research staff so that they have a good understanding why we're asking them to work in a particular way. And we will agree with the lab how often we review the incidence of hemolyzed samples and how investigations will be conducted when we encounter issues. So in terms of our risk review, what could it look like for our study? So we've determined our quality tolerance limit is 9%. So if 9% of our samples are hemolyzed and therefore unusable, we can live with that. But if it goes over, over that to 10%, we know we're going to be in trouble and we could end up having uh, results that are not robust. So in this study, we have four research sites throughout Europe. Um, and by some miracle, they're all going to start recruiting at the same time and at the same pace. And we expect this study to be recruited and completed in six months. So in the first month, we can see that in Paris, we have an immediate problem. Of the samples that they drew in the first month of the study, 9% of those were hemolyzed. And we find out when we do an investigation that they had a new member of staff that they recruited after we'd done our initial training. So we dispatched someone over to Paris, they do some training and some supervision, uh, and we're fairly confident that we've addressed the problem. So the next month in February, good news, we've seen an improvement in Paris and everybody else seems to be very stable as well, well below the quality tolerance limit. March brings some continued improvement in Paris, which is a good sign, but then a worrying increase in Munich. An investigation has started. Uh, we review both the training uh, that the, the research staff have been, have been receiving, and we also review the sample packs. By the time April comes around, it's very clear that we've got a problem in Munich. And we find out that there were some supply chain issues and that the sample drawing kits that were provided in Germany had the incorrect gauge of needle due to a shortage. So all unused kits are removed from that site and replaced with kits with the correct size needle. So the following month we see, luckily, a good decrease in, uh, in the instance of hemolyzed samples at Munich. And again, everything's going well in the other three centers. And finally, in the last month of the study, we can see that we've met our goal. All of the samples we received, the hemoly hemolysis has been below 10%. So we're confident that we've kept the data loss below that magic number. And whatever the final analysis reveals about our drug, we're able to report to management that we've delivered the necessary quality in order to determine the result. So let's just take a look at what, if we, what would happen if we hadn't controlled for these factors. So this could be a, a scenario if we hadn't 
gone into Paris and done that additional training, uh, we could have had uh, samples consistently above uh, 9% in terms of uh, unusable samples. And in Munich, we probably wouldn't have detected that we had the wrong size needle. So in this scenario here, we'd be very worried about the robustness of our data. So this is a very simplistic uh, example. And in a re real clinical study, there would be many other risks that we also have to control in parallel. But hopefully it goes to demonstrate how risk management can be more than just project bureaucracy. By adopting a risk management mindset, we have to have a shift in paradigm thinking, a shift in paradigms. We have to understand that perfection is not realistic and that we are going to get errors. We need to understand what the root causes of errors could be before we start our studies so we can design studies that will mitigate those risks. It means moving away from practically perfect and to an era where we're open and transparent, uh, where teams can focus on the activities which really matter to quality. It means that they can direct their resources to where they're needed most. Uh, and by having focused investigations, we can solve issues quickly. And importantly, working in this manner, teams develop a culture of identifying issues and learning from them. So moving away from a blame culture and towards a more positive way of conducting research. So it's very rarely realistic or efficient to eliminate all errors, uh, but by trying to control the ones which are gonna have the biggest impact of the data, we can have the best confidence in the reliability. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you Fiona. Well, I think that provides a really nice overview for um, much of what we're about to hear about in terms of uh, the different pilots that are being uh, implemented at different institutions um, across the UK. Um, so I think, We'll move straight on to our next speaker. Um, we're slightly ahead of schedule, but that's no bad thing, because if anything, uh, that will give us either a slightly longer break or a bit more time for questions at the end. So our next speaker is Mark Kelson, and he will talk about spot checks for reproducibility in a university setting. So, Mark, uh, over to you. And um... Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm going to try sharing screen here. I might even try introducing myself while I'm doing that. Can you all see this? And I go to presenter mode. Yeah, that looks good. OK, fantastic. So um, sorry, I was a bit late. Uh, my name is Professor Mark Kelson. I'm Associate Professor of Statistics for Health and currently Interim Co-Director of the Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence until we find someone better, which we have, and they're starting in August, which is going to be great. And um, my background is in clinical trials. Uh, so I did a decade in a clinic in an academic uh, registered clinical trials unit but for the past six years, I've, I've been out of that world and I'm back in a maths and stats department. And so um, I've taken on increasingly um, roles on, in re reproducibility. So I'm institutional co-lead for reproducibility and I've taken on an ethics role for the faculty. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing increasingly um, more on how we, how we instigate institutional level change. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about a new proposal uh, that we are thinking about at Exeter. And um, I should also highlight that there are seven institutions who are part of a consortium in the UKRN, at least seven, it might be more now, who are thinking about something similar, not like this, but some other kind of spot check. And so we are sharing expertise and sharing experiences in that wider group. And I think it will be really nice to have a, to have a proper you know, reflection on all of the, the seven different approaches that the different institutions are taking. This one is going to be focused on the University of Exeter and what we're thinking about. Now, I have presented on this in about four or five different forums, fora, whatever the plural is, um, at increasingly widening circles. And each time I kind of stress this is confidential. And I, it's starting to feel a little bit silly now because I've said it to so many people and um, what I would say is that this has not been announced in my institution. And in fact, this there is nothing to announce. Right. So there's, there's nothing has been formally submitted. I'm hopeful in the next month that we'll get a paper submitted to an executive board. But I would appreciate your discretion. And but I, you know, I, I think at, at some stage uh, we have to start talking a bit more openly about it. And I would also like to thank the UKRN for the opportunity to talk about this because the feedback I've received on each occasion has changed it. So if you've heard me speak about this before, you'll be hearing uh, about it, a different incarnation of it now because the feedback has been really helpful. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take us right back to, to what the general idea is, and then I'll talk to you about how we're 
proposing to refine this for our setting. So the general idea is a 333 spot check. Three figures or tables are selected from three recently published manuscripts or preprints every quarter, every, every three months. And I think the idea is that this might be done for three uh, principal investigators as well. And then the data, the underlying data from those figures or tables is shared with an external evaluator. And then that external evaluator assesses whether the work is reproducible. So I think, you know, recently published manuscripts is possible. Recently submitted, I think, is probably unlikely to be achieved. We don't, we don't find out about submissions. Um, and it is also restricted to original data. So this is the, the, the original idea, the 333, is restricted to original data that an institution might own or have, have complete ownership of. And the process is that the evaluator then, so that the, the PI gets randomly selected, um, three of their papers get selected, and then um, three figures or tables from those three papers, they're asked to demonstrate, to provide the data and the code to reproduce those findings. The independent evaluator uh, looks at this, all of this information that's done in a timely fashion. So that's all, to, you know, there's, there's detail here to be worked out. Um, and then if there is no case to answer, that's fine. That's the end of the process. If there's a case to answer, but ultimately everything is okay, then again, there's no problem. If there's a case to answer and the reproducibility is not demonstrated to a sufficient level, then there's sort of a yellow card system implemented and repeat infringements lead to some further action. So that's, that's the 333 process. Now, this idea has been taken wholesale from the Sainsbury lab in Oxford. And so the Sainsbury lab in Oxford, you can see here, this is a picture from their website, and they have a, a whole bunch of principal investigators. They grow plants and they do things to those plants. You can see three of them are bothering a plant here. And I think in that paradigm, you have you know, lots of capacity to, um, to, to demand this of your PI. So you know, you've got no ethics unless there's commercial sensitivities. The plants are, you know, there's no confidentiality issues. All of the data is in-house. The Sainsbury lab can implement this 333 process I would imagine very efficiently. And I say that completely ignorantly. I'm not a plant scientist. I'm sure the detail is complicated, but even still, I think, you know, this setting lends itself to this kind of spot check. Now, what we're trying to do in the University of Exeter is to apply this same mechanism, but to a whole institution, to the whole university. And I think that that comes with serious challenges. And, and every time I speak about this, I hear about more challenges. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very interested in the discussion that we're going to have um, coming up after, after these presentations. So obviously, we're in a position where we have to amend this because not everybody's working on plants. So what my perspective is, and I had a really useful conversation with uh, Fiona about this uh, earlier in the year, um, and I, I'm going to just highlight some, some changes that, that have been made as a result of that conversation. I think what I would like to do is to identify three articles that are um, recently published or pre-printed. So on the university server, this is a perspective kind of idea. We're not going to trawl back through people's papers and ask them to reproduce figures from 10 years ago. We're going to do this prospectively. And then um, three articles will be selected. That will probably lead to three um, authors being, being asked to reproduce a, a key finding or table. I'm not going to ask them to do three figures or tables from each paper. I think that's a bit overkill. From discussions with Fiona with the risk management approach, I think what I'd like to do is to select a paper, identify the key finding in that, whether that's presented in a table or a figure, it's probably mentioned in the abstract, whatever that key finding is, we hone in on that and say, that's your headline. Can you demonstrate the integrity and quality of that key finding? And I think in the first instance, we will have to work with the PI uh, to, to explore the reproducibility of that finding. I would like to engage with the PI and sort of um, everyone would learn through the process. You know, were, was the data stored properly? Was the code reusable? Um, was, the, was the finding actually uh, reproducible? 
And we, we would work together and, and identify and, and produce a report at the end about the reproducibility of it. And this would be an incredibly supportive process. You know, so this is coming from an ethos that researchers are overachievers. They want to do everything really well. They care about science. They care about the truth. So we're meeting them there and we're sort of doing this as a supportive kind of approach. We're helping them re-engage with reproducibility matters. It's bringing it up in their, in their consciousness. And that's kind of the approach. I want to, have, to re remove lots of the punitive language from my current white paper. So there's talk about wrongdoing. I mean, I'm you know, deleting the word wrongdoing. This is not about detecting fraud. This is about raising standards and just reminding people that this is what they should be doing. And um, I should also stress, this is against a backdrop in the University of Exeter where we have been uh, rolling out a series of workshops about uh, coding for reproducibility, basics of R, Python, um, and, and various other things, com computational thinking. We've got six workshops, and we've just done a whole series. We've trained over 500 people, um, and now we're entering the second phase of that, where we're, we're developing the intermediate courses, which follow on, and then eventually expert courses. So there's a lot of support here. We've put in a lot of support first over the past year and a half, and that will continue over the coming years. So people do have the tools to do work reproducibly. And I should also, well, I, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, so this is this is prospective work. And this is the the, the idea. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of softening the focus of this. Uh, I, I really want it to be kind of a learning um, type of spot check for the, the PIs. Um, so this is a question that I got uh, previously. Um, who would it apply to? And, and this is sort of, it's not a, an opt out. This would be anybody working in the university. And so that's what that's how it's currently formulated. If you're doing research in the university, this policy would apply to you and you could be randomly selected. OK, so um, whenever I talk about this, researchers immediately identify the many, many flaws and weaknesses in this approach. OK, and I, I get it. There's, you know, there's lots of, of things and I will talk about those, but I would just like to refocus us ever so slightly to first think about what might be the benefits. Why would we do this, this flawed approach? And I think one of the benefits, the, the, the stated benefit, is that it is light touch. It, it is not onerous for lots of people because most people don't get selected. So it's a, it's a quality strategy that improves things, but it does not mean lots of extra workload because the, the chances of an individual PI being selected are quite small. But I hope that by promoting the, the policy, that people would be aware that it, it can apply to them. Um, it can be handled supportively. It's, it's going to be a learning um, process for everybody. Case studies can be written from this, and uh, quality assurance documents can be, can be developed as a result of them so that you know, individual research groups don't continue to make the same mistakes if mistakes get found, which I'm sure there will. Um, we can talk about this externally, and this is a, an idea that um, I, I'm stealing from Bristol. Um, the idea being that you know we can go to external funders and we can go to um, companies and say, look, you can trust the work that the University of Exeter is producing because we have these layers of accountability and these layers of checks that you know maybe other institutions don't have yet. Um, and I think that that's that's quite a that's quite an attractive thing. I can see the policymakers in my institution being quite keen on that because I can talk about that leading to future investment. And you know, there's always going to be a financial aspect to these things when I take it to an executive board. It's an external incentive to motivate reproducibility. So you know, there's lots of reasons why people don't do their work in a reproducible way. And this is a reason against that. This, is, this will remind people at all levels. So the PIs, the people who are doing the coding, the people who are collecting the data, Everybody is going to be made aware of this policy if it gets um, if it gets put through uh, by the by the executive, um, and I think you know th that's that's really quite powerful, and it it w could lead to institutional change, and that would be the the real goal. Okay, so there are issues. Obviously, there are issues, and I'm really interested to hear from everybody if they have if they are identifying issues that I'm not covering here because I'm sure that there are more problems that that I'm I'm skirting over. And um, the first one is that, you know, I, I do think there needs to be an evaluator. I, I'm not comfortable 
with the idea of PIs marking their own homework. So, you know, if you go to a PI and say, show me the code, show me the data, and then they write a report saying, yeah, it was all fine. Well, you know, that's not really going to, to, to help us improve standards. Um, I do think you need someone else and someone else needs to be there and have the data shared with them and be able to, to reproduce the findings. That comes with problems though. You know, like if you're doing this in the Sainsbury lab and it's plants and everybody's using the same software, then that is one question. But we're talking about doing this at an institution level. And I think you would need an evaluator, maybe more than one, probably more than one, um, proficient in lots of different fields, lots of different coding languages, and lots of different software. The only saving grace, and this has happened since we started talking about this, is I do think that AI assistance might help quite a bit. Because I'm fairly confident now that if I get some code that I don't really understand, that with AI assistance, I think I could penetrate that reasonably quickly, even if it's code that, that I'm not familiar with. And so, you know, chat GPT, things like that might help us considerably in having a single evaluator be able to engage quickly in a, in a whole scientific field that they are not familiar with, it, to the extent that they could check whether the numbers work out. Like, you know, you're not going to become a plant scientist overnight, but you might be able to, with AI assistance, do this more efficiently. And what happens if the work is non-reproducible is an open question. And I, I think, you know, we do need to think carefully about that. At the moment, I'm comfortable with it being you know, a yellow card situation. Nobody likes to be in that scenario. And I think people would automatically improve. You know, I, I think most people are just good like that. And I think they would want to. But if it's an institution level policy, you do have to cover every eventuality. So I, I think there has to be something. And I, I, what I would like to do is lean, lean on existing other approaches for handling uh, you know, misconduct. So not have it associated with this policy in the slightest. This policy is not about misconduct. Um, there will be large exclusions. But the way I'm thinking about this, and I, I'm, I'm acutely aware the next two talks are also about computational reproducibility. And so I think that this is probably mostly suited to a computational reproducibility angle as well. And I think the reason like, why so many of us are, are, are focusing on this, and I'm gonna be extremely rude here now, is that you know, this, I think it's the low hanging fruit. This is the, the, the computational reproducibility is slightly more straightforward to conceptualize than the broader reproducibility questions. Um, anyway, so a non-quantitative work, I think, might be difficult to include just because I, I think it would be incredibly time consuming to redo a quantitative analysis. And um, maybe there are ways of, 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 of you know, checking um, a quantitative, a, a qualitative analysis um, that I'm not familiar with. But from the way I've been thinking about this to date has been about computational reproducibility. Um, we run a lot of climate science models at, at Exeter. So we work with the Met Office a lot. So huge models taking weeks and months to run. I think things like that are very difficult to assess. Um, you know, we, we don't have the, the compute. We, it costs money to, to recheck those things. And so that would be, I think, you know, that would be a large chunk of the University of Exeter's work that might not be um, accessible in this way. If there's proprietary software and we don't really want to buy a license uh, for somebody to just do a check, then I think we 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 might have to think about workarounds for that. Going to someone's lab and using their software, there, having a demonstration, it becomes slightly like marking your own homework, but I think it's better than nothing. And any kind of data that is not shareable for ethical, legal, commercial, you know, defense reasons, um, I think it's going to be really really challenging to actually get some other evaluator and I'm, I'm, I'm not en envisaging an external evaluator I'm thinking it's somebody in the university but even still um, just the permissions to um, to allow for um, for sharing I, you know, I, I work in clinical trials um, it's it's too long it, it would take too long to get uh, somebody signed up to to get the to get access to the data so there are huge issues and I'm sure that there are more and I'd love to hear from from lots of you there are further open questions. And, um, you know, we do need to, I, I would love it to apply to everybody in the university, but I think there will be exclusions. Is that okay? Is it okay to exclude entire fields like climate science if their models are too big or, you know, qualitative work if we feel like th th that it's, it's not as easy to assess? 
Um, is it too focused on computational reproducibility? Um, and these, these are open questions. I mean, any policy is not going to be able to answer all questions. Um, so I, I kind of feel like it's legitimate to focus on computational reproducibility so long as you have other things that, that focus on other aspects of reproducibility. Um, is it feasible to do this at a university level? And I do think we probably need to incorporate a strong element of piloting in this. So I think we probably would want to pilot this in a single department first, get some institutional sign off ahead of department or something like that, and, and demonstrate that it is possible to do this over six months. And, and then the other big question is, is it the right approach to have a central process for this? Or should, should our pilot allow for um, situational and contextual intricacies to be incorporated? And maybe this is something that is done at a departmental level. And um, so if we could, could demonstrate in a pilot that it works for a department, maybe it isn't a central thing. Maybe it isn't one evaluator for the whole university. Maybe it is multiple evaluators with less work in each department. Okay, um, so I, I think we are we remain ahead of time, um, but I'm very happy to have questions if there are any questions. I mean, I, I think the plan is that we're going to save them for the end, I think. Is that right? I'm going to pass back to, to Marcus. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think just in the interest of consistency, we'll um, we'll leave questions to the end. I doubt people will mind having five more minutes for a sort of, you know, drink of choice in the uh, in the break. But I think that's been a great introduction. We've been given quite a sort of high level uh, introduction about how, I think, how things are done in the pharmaceutical industry, and then uh, a more focused uh, overview of an example of what this kind of approach might look like at a university level. I think there are some interesting thoughts emerging already. For example, um, Fiona's uh, talk focused very much on how we can ensure, to some extent at least, the quality of individual data points and how we collect those data, whereas uh, Mark's talk focused more on then looking at the resulting data sets and code that goes with that. And of course, those two things are complementary. And um, it would be interesting to think about how those two approaches could inform each other. In other words, using the approach that Mark described to then think about, well, why did problems arise? It's worth thinking that you can have um, code that is reproducible, but if the underlying data set hasn't passed the tests that Fiona is describing, then actually that only gets you so far in ensuring the eventual quality of the research that you produce. So these are complementary approaches rather than um, it being an either or scenario. And I think we need to think about how we can weave together different elements of that. Some of that may come out in the talks uh, that will happen after the break. But a key thing with all of this and something to maybe return to in the Q&A is how we resource all of this. As you say, it takes people. It takes people with certain skill sets who um, will need to be employed at a certain level. Uh, are those going to be attractive career pathways for people who might want to stay in academia but not necessarily be PIs? I think there might well be appetite for these kinds of roles, given that many postdoctoral researchers want to remain in academia but don't necessarily want the pressure of having to apply for grants the whole time um, or the burden that comes with for example teaching and administration if you're on a, um, a sort of conventional academic path so lots of questions there around how to resource it but perhaps one thing that we might want to think about at the end is if we pilot these things how can we demonstrate the value to universities of this approach so that they effectively continue to put their hands in their own pockets, knowing that there will be a return on that investment in terms of ref outcomes, translational impact, whatever it might be, that has a quantifiable benefit to the university that uh, justifies the resource that would need to go into approaches of this kind. So lots of questions there that we can return to in the Q&A. Um, it's a quarter to two in the UK now, so we'll return at the top of the hour, so two o'clock if you're in the UK, but some people may be in um, other time zones and move on to the next two talks. So you have slightly longer for the break, but thank you for our, uh, to our first two speakers. That was fantastic. Um, please stay on the call, but uh, you can mute your, um, yourselves and turn your video off uh, while you have a leg stretch and I'll see you all in 15 minutes. Fantastic. So thank you all. Welcome back. Um, I hope you had a good break. We'll move straight on to our next two speakers uh, following on the theme of computational reproducibility. So our first speaker is Renny Bykova and she'll be talking about pre-submission certification of computational reproducibility. So I will hand straight over to her. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rennie. I completed my PhD at the University of Sussex in 2020. And since then, I've been a postdoc at the School of Informatics. Uh, in March this year, I started 
splitting my time between the School of Informatics and the School of Psychology. And now I'm working on this pilot project, which aims to certify the computational reproducibility of papers at the School of Psychology before they're sent out for publication to journals. So first, uh, one definition of computational reproducibility would be the ability to recreate the wait, I have a thing in the middle. Okay, there we go. The original uh, results reported in a manuscript using the data and code, or if code is not available, then at least a very detailed description of the analysis pipeline. This would include an independent researcher being able to recreate the quantitative findings, figures and tables, as well as inferential conclusions that are reported in the paper. And in recent years, we've seen a push towards greater transparency and open data, which is necessary for reproducibility. Uh, however, while this is a good step in the right direction, it has shown us that there are still issues with repro reproducibility that we need to address more carefully. Um, Journals are Already, theoretically- Already slides aren't advancing. What slide do you see now? The title slide. Oh, okay, I've stopped sharing now. It's possible I have shared the wrong thing. Thank you. All right, we start from scratch. Okay, we shared this and now We've made it full screen. Can people see the second slide? <laughs> Very good. We went through this. We're not going to go through it again. So uh, journals are theoretically in a position to help uh, improve reproducibility by employing certain policies, and some journals do that. So some examples are the American Journal of Political Science and the Biometric Journal. In both of these journals, you are required to provide coded data to reproduce the results. Uh, more importantly, as part of the review process, there is an independent person who's either a researcher somewhere else or a reproducibility editor at the journal who has to be able to reproduce all the results in the paper and publication is contingent on the successful reproduction of all the results. And while this is great, most journals don't have such policies and they, they can't do enough to ensure the reproducibility of the results in the papers that are published. Uh, for example, in 2011, Science implemented an open data policy, which requires that readers have access to all the data and all the code that is required to reproduce the results. However, in the first year after this uh, policy was implemented, it was found that out of the 204 articles that were published, only about 26% would be reproducible. Another fun example is psychological science, who give an open data badge to articles which share the data and code that is required to reproduce the results. And in addition, as a requirement for submitting, getting, the, getting your article published, you need to certify that you've produced, that you've shared all of the data and all of the materials that are needed to reproduce the results in your paper. Uh, however, a recent study found that in one issue in psychological science where all of the articles had an open data badge, only four were reproducible and only one met the requirements of the badge. And one last example, those issues are also present in register reports where people are, like people who write register reports already have some this some drive towards open data and transparency they want to do things right and even in those cases uh one study found that again not all study not all results reproduce so journals most journals don't have the policies and they don't provide the support needed to researchers to make sure that their results are reproducible when they submit their papers so one potential solution to this problem would be to bring the encouragement towards more reproducibility in-house. And this is where our, our project comes in. So the key aim of our pilot project is to establish a process here at the 
School of Psychology, Psychology at Sussex uh, that would allow the reproducibility of papers to be established before they're submitted for publication. And this is going to be done as an, it, this is already happening in a more optional uh, manner. So people are informed about the project and they decide to opt in. And we're trying to lure them into the project by hang, dangling academic carrots at them about all of the great stuff that they're going to gain by going through this process, which at first they think will be great and very fun. And then I, I talk to them and they realize it's going to be very long and painful. Um, hopefully, by engaging in this process, we hope to educate researchers about reproducibility, because even though people want to do things right, they don't necessarily know how or have the skills because we have not been taught how to do this. I think most of us haven't, at least in psychology. And hopefully this would allow to improve the reproducibility of the studies that are getting published, as well as the studies that people get to design later on. And at the larger scale, we hope that as more and more people join in and decide to engage in this process, this would create like an organic, gentle push in the right direction uh, so that researchers themselves push the boundaries of what standards should be and hold themselves accountable to doing things right and better because now they have the skills, now they have the knowledge and they have someone checking all of their stuff, which is me in this case. So how would this process of certifying reproducibility uh, look like? Uh, so first people, we're gonna inform people throughout different avenues about the perks of participating, highlighting that it is very optional to take part. Uh, so some of the perks that can be identified is that a paper that has in the abstract and if, like, all other places in the paper where you deem appropriate, a statement which says that an independent statistician has checked and reproduced all of the results, all of the analysis, it's all great, it's all amazing, is going to really make papers stand out in terms of open data and reproducibility. And this could potentially encourage journals to implement their policies a little bit more strictly, like psychological science, who already have something like this, but it's not working very well. Uh, in addition, having someone go through your code and go through your results and try to reproduce everything is going to help find any mistakes or errors that might be there because we all make errors and mistakes. And lastly, this gives you a peace of mind that when you share your data and share your code online, someone is not gonna come back at you a year later and say, this is wrong. It has nothing works. What have you done? So you have a lot more confidence in the materials you're sharing and it's, it would speed up the peer review process in case there is a mistake that, that would get found before peer review. It would make that process a lot smoother and a lot less painful. So after we have managed to convince people that this is a great idea to take part in, those who decide to opt in would send their materials to me or another independent statistician, but in this case, to me. And while participation is optional, this process does require that the data be uploaded online uh, before the process starts. Um, then I will complete an initial report and researchers will have the opportunity to make any amends if desired or if such amends have been identified. Uh, the idea is to help people improve the reproducibility of their studies. So it's, it's gonna be a little bit more it is designed to be collaborative in that if people don't know about something, I can help them figure it out and ultimately improve their study before it gets published. Uh, finally, I will upload the final report on OSF and researchers can rave all about it in their manuscript if they so desire. It's not mandatory at all to link to the, re to the report if people don't want to. Uh, all of this is entirely optional and we're just we're just hoping we'll be able to provide the tools and support for people to feel empowered to do it and to produce reproducible studies that they feel 
comfortable and excited and confident to promote as such everywhere in their manuscript. Uh, currently, the reproducibility report uh, is in the form of a template that's divided into six sections that each follow on different, each focus on different aspects of reproducibility, like the reproducibility of the data processing, analysis environment, analysis pipeline, the reproducibility of the numerical results, inferential conclusions, and figures and tables. The template will evolve as people learn new tools in order to push standards. There is currently no point in telling people about uh, version control through GitHub and all those stuff, all those things. Git, sorry, not GitHub, Git, because most people don't know about it and would just scare them away. So we're starting from a, again, a, a place that would still be a little bit higher complexity than what more people, most people are comfortable with, but still in the realm of stuff that they've most likely heard about and can uh, can imagine. And then as people get more and more comfortable with the stuff we're throwing at them, we're gonna throw com more complicated and more complicated things in that make their studies more and more reproducible. Uh, all template versions will be stored on OSF along with a detailed document that explains what updates and changes have been made uh, through with each version and the reports will specify the template version that was used. Uh, to get a feel of what the template looks like, this is the current section with questions around the reproducibility of data processing. So I've tried to make it as streamlined as I can and I'm pretty sure very quickly the very strict categories of yes, no and not applicable will become not applicable and I'll need something a little bit more partial in there, but uh, there is space to give any nuance when needed. So the key things here are whether the raw data has been shared online, if not, what, how close is the data that is shared online to the raw data, how many pre-processing steps have happened in between, whether the pre-processing of the data is reproducible, and whether the data is accompanied by a detailed enough description of the data. Uh, I haven't shared the, for the rest of the sections, I just have example items because they're much, a little bit longer and, and a little bit too detailed, I feel. But if anyone wants to see the current version of the template, I'm very happy to show it later. Uh, the section on the reproducibility of the analysis environment is all around, all about the software that people use whether the software is available, open source, whether the specific version is something that people can get their hands on, if any required add-ons that are not part of the base software are also easy to acquire. Um, then one of the most important sections, I think, is the reproducibility of the analysis pipeline. And that is, a, this includes questions around how, how reproducible the analysis steps that people did are. In the best case scenario, people we will use code and that code will run without amendments. Um, there are also questions around how much manual interaction is required within the software or if, uh, the, so if, the, if the code is uh, well enough commented to be legible. Uh, then we come to the section that most people believe will be all that they hear about, which is the reproducibility of the numerical results. And this is the shortest section right now, because essentially it has some questions around rounding and whether people use uh, any random numbers. But the, the only question really here that matters is whether the reproduced numerical results match the results in the manuscript. And people, people don't acknowledge, people do think when they hear re, uh, computational reproducibility, they think this is all that's gonna be covered. And then I hit them with the template and they're like, okay, this is much, much, there's much more going on here than I expected. And the reality is that the rest of the sections take, take the longest time to complete. This is the shortest and easiest. Uh, one of the more difficult sections, sections to complete is the reproducibility of inferential conclusions, which covers whether uh, I can get from the inferential statistics to the conclusions that people uh, report regarding their hypotheses in the manuscript. And this involves questions like whether the rules to interpret inferential statistics are described and whether following those rules leads to the same conclusions. And finally, uh, there is 
a short section on the reproducibility of figures and tables, which is short because I forgot the tables exist and these need to be added into the template. But this includes questions like whether the data represented in figures and the appearance of figures matches uh, the figures that are in the manuscript. So one thing that we haven't discussed in detail uh, is whether we want to provide a rating for the reproducibility of each uh, section. I have a natural uh, desire to classify things and give things marks and grades, but this is sometimes a very um, emotional process for people, especially if they get into the orange or red category. So this is just what example criteria would be for two of the sections. And if we are to implement something like this, the goal would be to get people into the green areas of the of the templates before before their report is shared online. So we want to promote good practice, not uh, punish people who have not done what I've told them to do. And so this project has now been running for a month and a half. And we, I think we have some lessons that we have learned in this very short time frame. Uh, first, quite surprisingly, there is quite a bit of demand for uh, people to get their papers reproduced. We've received, I think in the first two weeks, we received six studies, four behavioral, one fMRI, one EG, which has so far proven much more than I can get through um, because reproducibility certification takes time. Uh, the first report I started working on was the fMRI project, and I didn't we didn't have a template at the time, and that took me about eight days to semi-complete, because the people, this, they, they, we'll get to that later, but they submitted their paper before I managed to complete the report. And this took eight days, considering that they only wanted a part of the paper reproduced. It wasn't even the whole thing, but I still felt the need to understand everything else around it. So I, I didn't feel comfortable making a judgment only on the things that they wanted me to reproduce without understanding the context of what's happened to the data and to the analysis beforehand. Uh, the second report I completed was using the template and that took roughly four days of full-time work. And this was a behavioral study. And also it has to be mentioned that the code of the, this, this study was coded perfect. Like the statistical analysis of the study was coded very well. It all ran, it was all great. All of the results were produced in the way, in the exact order in which they appeared in the manuscript. So the numerical reproducibility of the results was very easy to check, but it still took me quite a bit of time to get through the other sections. So we need to still tr try and figure out how to streamline the process. The template would obviously help. Um, yeah, so as I alluded to earlier, two of the manuscripts were submitted before I managed to complete the report. And the report will be eventually linked in the publication upon journal acceptance. But ideally, we want to make it a little bit more streamlined so that people get the report before they submit and get all the benefits of it. And that's it. I want to say thank uh, Zoltan and Lincoln for welcoming me into the team and the University of Sussex and the UKRI for sponsoring uh, this project. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think going back to some of the comments we made earlier, that gives some sense of the kind of level of resource that's required to do this kind of thing properly. Um, and that goes back to those conversations we'll need to have about what the right balance is and how we can demonstrate the, the return on that investment for universities and perhaps speaks to wider issues around the extent to which academia in general has perhaps focused too much on, on quantity rather than quality over the years. And we need to address that balance. Um, but that's another provocation for later. Um, before we come to that, we have one last talk. And so I'm going to ask Daniel Baker to, uh, to speak next, our final speaker. Um, and his talk is Reproduce Me, a pilot project on computational reproducibility. Thanks, Marcus. Is the screen sharing working for yep. good? OK, uh, great. So, yes, as Marcus said, I'm Daniel Baker. I'm a senior lecturer uh, in the Department of Psychology at the University of York. And uh, somewhat unusually for a psychologist, I'm also a chartered statistician. So I've kind of done enough enough stuff with numbers that uh, 
<laughs> that I qualify for that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to talk today about a pilot study that we're running here at York, which is also funded by uh, the Research England uh, Enhancing Research Culture Fund. Um, and I guess many of the themes here are very similar to what Rennie's just described. Um, so we're interested in computational reproducibility, which is the ability to independently repeat the analyses that have been described in a paper or, or in a study. Um, I think that's really important for transparency because it means that anybody reading the paper can check exactly what's been done, uh, be that the, the uh, reviewer or, or editor or just somebody reading a paper after it's been published. It's become quite common, at least in my field, to post data online, but that's actually not very helpful unless you can see how it's been analysed. And it's really quite rare, uh, at least in psychology, for people to make analysis code available as well. Um, part of the motivation for all of this, of course, is that uh, increasingly, apart from that it's the right thing to do, of course, but increasingly uh, we're hearing murmurs that the next ref is likely to take account of open science practices when it evaluates publications. Uh, and I think that computational reproducibility is a really important goal to aim for. So, reproducibility can mean different things to different people. And the very simplest version might just be posting some analysis code and some data to a repository like the OSF. But in fact, there are now quite a lot of tools available that let you do much, much more than that. So for example, if someone's posted some code and data online, you might manually need to download that and put everything in the right place and often change some paths in the code to point to where the data files live on your computer. All of that is quite fiddly and it represents a barrier to reproducibility. Alternatively, it's now possible to script downloading of data. So that might mean that the end user just has to download one piece of code or one code repository, and then it will grab all of the data files that it needs from wherever they're stored on the internet. Um, more complex still, there are now tools available called Markdown tools, and in particular, I like to use R Markdown. And what they do is combine code, text, and figures um, to produce the final manuscript from the raw data. And the first time I ever saw an example of this, I was absolutely blown away. It was a stats paper, um, and it just mentioned somewhere in the manuscript, all of the code required to reproduce the analyses in this paper are available from here. And I went there and I found a single markdown document. And when you ran it, it did indeed produce the whole paper. It made all the figures, it did all the analyses and put all the numbers where they needed to go in the text and made a PDF. And I think that's an incredibly powerful tool. We also now have tools that allow you to preserve the full computational environment that was used to do an analysis. And I'll say a bit more about that later. So I've come up with this idea, uh, which is a bit cheesy, but I call it the reproducibility pyramid. And it's worth just saying that virtually everything that's published is not reproducible. So certainly everything that's more than about 20 years old, not reproducible at all. And even most contemporary research is not reproducible at all. Of work that is reproducible, it's what I call level one reproducible most of the time. So there might be some data and some scripts available, but you've got to do quite a lot of work to get them and to get them working, to get all the right packages. And, you know, as time goes on, these things will become less and less faithful representations of the original analysis that was done just because of things like package versions changing and, and so on. Level two reproducibility. Um, as I call it in my pyramid, is where you have a piece of code that automatically gets everything it needs. So that means that you can run a single script and it will find all the code and all the packages and everything it needs and download them and run the analysis. Level three reproducibility is what I described using a markdown script to produce the full analysis pipeline. So you go ideally from the raw data as they were collected, you run all of your analyses, produce all of your figures, do all of your stats and generate a PDF that is the paper. 
Um, and that's something that I think is, is an amazingly powerful thing. And then the absolute pinnacle of this is to encapsulate all of that analysis pipeline and all of the tools and all of the software that you need into a reproducible environment, a container, if you like, and I'll explain a bit more about how that works later. Um, and that's something that I think we're, we're aiming for and have just about got there in the last few weeks. Um, so uh, just for those of you who aren't familiar with some of these ideas, here's an example of some uh, of Markdown and how it works. Uh, so I've done this in R, but there are equivalent things in other programming languages, including live scripts in MATLAB, Jupyter Notebooks in Python, um, and some online tools like uh, Google's Colab tool. They basically do the same kinds of things. So you might have a chunk of R code, and at the top here, I've just got two very simple lines of code that run a t-test in R. They'll be familiar to anybody that's, that's used R for basic stats before. What would usually happen is you would run that code, you would see the output, and then you would manually type the numbers from the output into the text in a paper. So you might type in the T value, as in this example down at the bottom, and the degrees of freedom and the P value. But what Markdown allows you to do is plug the, the output from this code directly into some text. So you can see in this middle chunk here, we've got the words, a so one sample t-test was conducted on the data, so and so on and so on. But then we've also got some bits of code which are presenting the numbers that have come directly from the statistics. And when the whole thing renders in a PDF, you get something that looks like a normal result section with the numbers plugged in where they're supposed to be. But those have come directly from the analysis. So there's no room there for uh, typos, for people doing funny things with rounding and so on. Here's a more complex example that comes from a real paper. At the top, again, we have some analysis code. In the middle, we have the markdown script that plugs that into uh, the text. And then at the bottom is the rendered output that you actually get uh, in a results section. Um, and this is possible for empirical work. So we started doing this in my lab and we've done it now for about four or five papers um, using this one-click approach where there is a single script and it does everything. So it, grabs all of the data that it needs, does all of the analyses, and produces the final manuscript, the final paper. And some of these are empirical papers that involve really quite large data sets using techniques like EEG and pupillometry, where the data, uh, the raw data might take tens of gigabytes of storage space, for example. Uh, they might involve quite complex analyses, in particular things like computational modeling. Uh, I've been getting into Bayesian modeling, so some of this uses things like STAN, which might take uh, perhaps a day or two to run the modeling. But at the end of it all, you still end up with the, uh, with the final paper. Um, and doing this in my own lab has had a pretty positive reception from reviewers and editors when we've submitted things to journals. So I started thinking this was something that we should be doing more widely. And so I pitched a project to our University's Enhancing Research Culture Fund um, that I've called Reproduce Me. And the idea is that it introduces reproducibility as a service. So we have a team of PhD students uh, who are all very good. They're all computationally very uh, competent and they've been trained in the art, I guess, of reproducibility, a bit like the Avengers where we're putting a team together. Uh, so four of them are PhD students. One is actually a master's student, but they're all very good at, at programming. And the idea is uh, to pay them to make other people's manuscripts reproducible. The idea is that that would happen ideally just before people submit to a journal. So they would finish writing their paper, they would hand it over to us, and we would turn it into a reproducible document. They would also give us the data and the code. Actually, we realized that you can do this retrospectively for published work, but I think it's gonna have the biggest impact if it happens before things have been submitted for peer review. And the aim in this project, uh, which is just a pilot project, is to process 10 papers in this way between February and July. So what we aim to do is to take a completed paper and work with the authors to make it reproducible. Ideally, it will be analyses which are scripted. So R scripts, for example, Python scripts, MATLAB scripts, that kind of thing. But in principle, we could also take analyses that have been done in a graphical uh, piece of software, uh, sorry, a, a 
piece of software with a graphical interface like SPSS and turn those into a scripted form as long as we have a good enough understanding of what the analyses were. Um, so often that involves collating existing scripts and text from the paper into a markdown document. Um, so far we've been doing that with R, but we're also very happy to do it with other languages. And then ultimately it will be that script that would be shared online and that would allow anybody to reproduce the whole manuscript on their own computer, uh, downloading the data. And we're using popular online platforms like GitHub and the Open Science Framework. Now, it's important to say what we're not going to do as well. So the aim here is not to be a statistical analysis service. We're not aiming to do analyses for people. We're obviously also not aiming to write papers for people. And critically, we're not really aiming to tell people that they've done something wrong. So our view here is that we're not necessarily domain experts in a particular area. And uh, conventions differ across even different branches of psychology. Uh, so the aim isn't to say to people, hey, hang on, you shouldn't really be doing a t-test there, or wait a minute, shouldn't you have greenhouse geyser corrected this ANOVA? It's just to reproduce what they've actually done. We see it more as the job of peer reviewers at the next stage when something's submitted to a journal to, to, to choose to uh, uh, indicate and judge whether the analyses are correct. What we're trying to do is make sure that they're reproducible. So it's definitely what's being reported in the paper. We also don't require any credit for this, any co-authorship or other recognition, uh, though, of course, the, the authors of the papers that we make reproducible are encouraged to uh, make it clear that the, that the paper is reproducible and to link to the reproducible version online. Uh, some caveats, there are types of analyses which can't really be made reproducible. Uh, so I think Fiona um, or somebody earlier, can't remember who now, uh, mentioned qualitative research, um, and that generally would be quite hard to make computationally reproducible because it's not computational. Uh, but there are other things as well. So anything involving manual coding, for example, manual coding of videos, um, we wouldn't be able to go from the raw data there, but what we would do is the next best thing. So if the manual coding has resulted in a, a spreadsheet of, of whatever it is, gesture codes or something, then we would go from that for the next uh, part of the analysis. And that's what we've tried to make reproducible. Um, to do all of this, we've come up uh, a bit like Rennie was saying with some standardized forms and some training materials. Uh, so we have an initial scoping form that collates information about each study and we uh, have a discussion with the authors where we get all of this information from them, find out where the data are and so on. I've put together a training manual for reproducibility that contains some example code snippets and some advice and suggestions about how to make things more effective and more efficient. Um, and one of the students produced a cheat sheet of frequently used keyboard shortcuts and syntax and so on in, in our markdown, which has turned out to be really useful. I learned loads from that, actually. Uh, also, finally, we've made a, a, a sort of feedback report form at the end for us to feedback any issues that arose to the authors, including any suggestions and recommendations. So anything that we weren't able to reproduce, anything that didn't work, any problems that we had with, with the whole process. Um, we've done this now for one complete paper, and we started with one of mine because it was just sort of easier because uh, I, I knew the work and I definitely had everything available. Uh, so it's a paper that was published just a, a month or so ago in neuroscience. Uh, and we took the, uh, and this wasn't originally written in Markdown, so we took the original uh, Word file and we took the original um, R scripts that did all of the analysis and we uh, created a markdown document uh, which generates a PDF of the full manuscript. Um, and that's now available on GitHub. Um, and uh, we've, we point to the final version. We've got the DOI numbers of the final publication as well. Um, and we also link back to the GitHub from the OSF repository where the data uh, and code for the original submitted version of that paper live. So we've done that and we learned a lot in that process for doing that first paper. Um, it worked very well. One of the things we did for the very first time was to produce a completely reproducible environment using a system called Docker. Uh, Docker is basically a, a system for making like a pocket universe for analysis. So it creates a full um, 
operating system with all the software that you need in a sort of sandboxed container which runs on your computer but completely independently from for example the versions of that software you might have installed natively on your machine um, what you do uh, is create what's called an image file which defines that definition and that's just a text file which anybody can then download on their computer and run through docker which will produce a version a, a computational environment that has all of the exact package versions that were used in the original analysis. Now, at the moment, that doesn't sort of matter that much because obviously at the moment we're using the current versions of all available packages. But thinking ahead to the future in 10 years, in 20 years, when we're on you know, R version 10 uh, and everybody's using a quantum computer that runs Windows uh, 13 or something ridiculous, we, don't, we can't guarantee that everything will work so Docker allows you to guarantee that. It freezes all of the steps of the analysis pipeline and makes sure that they will work for an indefinitely long period. There are also some online services. So there's something called mybinder.org that does something very similar, hosted on a remote server rather than hosted native locally on the uh, user's computer. Uh, but from my playing around with that, it seems to be much slower and quite a lot harder to control. Uh, so I, I'm not a big fan of Docker, uh, of uh, my binder, but I do like Docker. Okay, our big issue, our big worry about this project was recruitment. Um, and I was very concerned that I would suggest this to colleagues and nobody would be interested. But I gave a talk not dissimilar to this one at our research away day about three or four weeks ago and explained um, what we had in mind. And by the time I'd finished that talk, I already had three emails of people volunteering their papers. And we've since had, we've now got about 10 papers in the pipeline. Um, they involve diverse methods. Uh, so there are three studies on sleep. Uh, there's one uh, randomized control trial, which I think is gonna be a bit tricky because they did their analysis in starter, but I think we might be able to convert it to R. Uh, we've got a couple of social psychology studies. There's a long COVID study about cognition in people with long COVID. And we've also got two stage two registered reports. So these are papers that have been provisionally accepted. The data's just been finished with collection and they're just about to uh, put together the final manuscript and then hand it over to us to make reproducible. Um, so that's actually worked amazingly well. We've done much better than I had hoped at this stage with recruitment. And I think that that means that by the end of the pilot at the end of July, we will have done 10 papers. That was our, our target. I think we may end up doing more than 10 papers actually. Uh, looking to the future then, um, I think reproducibility is gonna become more commonplace. And I think uh, Rennie had some nice examples of journals. I think there are one or two others. I think MetaSci check reproducibility is meta psychology. Um, but I think more journals will start to require this. Um, what we're hoping is that the authors who volunteered their work for this pilot project, once they've seen how it's done for an example that they're intimately familiar with because it's their own work, they will perhaps start to do this themselves uh, for their own future studies. So we're hoping that uh, practice will kind of spread. And of course, all of these training materials are, are freely available to anybody. So we're, well, we're very keen to pass them on and have other people use these methods. Um, also, of course, I've trained five students to do this now. And so their own PhD work, they're more likely to make reproducible. And if they go off and uh, take on postdoc jobs or faculty jobs in the future, hopefully they'll make this part of their own sort of normal scientific practice. Um, we're thinking that if this goes well, we might try to ask the university for more money and roll this service out for longer, perhaps involving more departments at York, though obviously that's going to be very dependent on funding. But something else that occurred to me is that, well, we, we obviously have this great superordinate group, the UK Reproducibility Network, and so perhaps it would be worth trying to establish something central, so a cross-institutional system, a national uh, system for making things reproducible. I don't know how that will be funded. It could be done on a sort of fee basis. So many things in academic publishing, uh, for example, open access charges, there's a charge associated. So perhaps when people write grant proposals, they could say, and would like however much, a thousand pounds or something, to send this manuscript off to the reproducibility service and have it made reproducible for us. I don't know whether there'd be much appetite for that. Um, I guess it's something we could look into, uh, but it might be worth discussing. Um, now we're reaching the end of this session and the, and the sort of uh, panel section, whether it would be worth looking into how we could 
establish something like this at a, a superordinate level, at a sort of national level, or potentially even international level. Uh, reproducibility and science in general are not just the things that happen in the UK, so maybe this is something that might be useful globally. Um, I don't know. Okay, that's my delusions of grandeur over, so I'll uh, stop screen sharing um, and uh, also stop talking. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a great way to end. And it's worth saying, of course, that as well as UKRN, we now have, um, I think it's close to 15 other national reproducibility networks modelled in a very similar way to UKRN at different stages of evolution and maturity, admittedly. But that would provide a structure for some kind of national, international or supranational uh, coordination and standardisation as well. Um, that might increase complexity and bureaucracy. So that may be one of the questions that we explore. And it, uh, but on the other hand, it's worth bearing in mind that um, there are potentially some fixed costs associated with this approach. So a collaborative approach might actually be much more cost effective with institutions um, contributing something to a central pot, for example, that could support this. On the other hand, we don't want to make it feel like um, an external, external audit. We have enough things like that with REF and TEF and TEF and all the rest of it. So uh, adding something else to the mix probably wouldn't land that well in the UK, at least at the moment. Uh, so thinking about how to make this kind of thing work is probably a key part of the discussion that we're hopefully about to have. So I have a few thoughts, but I'll um, pause in case anyone has any immediate questions. So as I mentioned at the beginning, please put a question into the chat if you want to, or pop your hand up. And if you do pop your hand up, ideally, if you don't mind, it'd be great if you could turn your camera on and briefly introduce yourself. Um, and we have one already, which is Lincoln. So I'll come straight to you. Um, hi, Daniel. Um... Great, great talk. Uh, you're doing a lot of things that I think are, are, are a really good idea. Um, but I had like a, I had a couple of suggestions um, for something that you might want to look at. Um, I don't know. Is it all right if I share my screen to show to show something? I'm gonna see if it will allow me to. Um, so so I'll say this is a paper that I published a couple of years ago where we use this approach of using Docker uh, and also my binder to make everything reproducible. So we have a Git repository, uh, we have a little link, we have a my binder link, and then that will click, if you click on that, it'll open up uh, to an RStudio instance. But as you mentioned, with my binder, it can take a long time to load up, it can be a little bit slow and can be kind of annoying. Um, so what I've been doing as a uh, more recently, so I was one of the co-authors on that paper where we did that reproducibility audit of psych science. One of the things that I try to do is like, okay, if we're going to write these reports, let's try and make the reports as reproducible as possible. So the approach that I'm taking now is still using Docker. So we still have a GitHub repository. But now what we do is we, well, what I've done is I use uh, GitHub Actions. So a GitHub Action is, um, a bit of code that lives in your Git repository. And whenever certain things happen on your Git repository, for example, you commit new changes, then that code will automatically run uh, and it will you know, do whatever you want. And in this case, what it does is it actually pulls down a Docker image, it uh, pulls down the data from the OCF and it runs it all. And then it spits out onto a new branch, it spits out a report. And so now in this case, it's like totally hands-free. No one has to do anything. Just whenever you commit a new change to your Git repository, it's automatically gonna go through and it's gonna reproduce your entire analysis without you having to do anything. And it's gonna produce your, uh, your uh, report. So now it's like, yeah. So it's a, it's a completely hands-free approach. There's nothing that anyone needs to do. You just have to work as usual. And then you've got this reproduce, reproducibility check running in the background constantly with any change that you make to the manuscript. So I think like using, you know, tools like that, like GitHub Actions or Travis CI or, or any of these kind of other um, CI CD tools that, that we use in software engineering, I think that's like something that we should be doing more when we're trying to um, build uh, kind of reproducible data analysis pipelines. So that's, that's just a suggestion of something that you might want to kind of look into and like add to your uh, add to your tool belt. Yeah, that that's amazing. I I sort of vaguely knew that things like that might be possible, but I've I, I haven't had the technical competence to work out how to do it. So that that's really great to see an example of that. I will uh, raid your game. Feel free to 
better. Feel than, free to drop me an email <laughs> if you anyone. want any uh, tips or advice or anything. No, that's that's brilliant. Thank you. That's really interesting. And I think that's a nice example of why we are uh, bringing together that uh, that group of seven plus institutions that Mark mentioned in his talk, so that we can learn from each other and and um, and share good practice. Um, one question I would ask Fiona. So you are a relative outsider in the sense that you've uh, just joined the university from uh, from a different sector, albeit with you know some understanding of how academia works. Obviously, you have an academic background yourself, but um, I just wondered if you had any reflections on. The other presentations and how they might interdigitate with the approach that you described thinking about that comment i made earlier about the process itself and how we actually collect the data versus the the resulting uh, integrity of the data set and the code that um that should go together for example yeah i think that's a really good point what what we don't want to do is we don't want to be in a situation where we're doing the check so late in the process that what we what we're discovering is that there's that the, the the research is beyond salvage. That's the absolute worst case scenario. So I think the timing of the checks is really, really key. Um, you know, uh, and in terms of interim checks, what, what can you run on an ongoing basis? And if your research is iterative, you know, if you're building on something, if your research is structured in in stages, um, you know, can you can you do some risk analysis on that and do some interim? you know, analysis and running of code as you build your research up. So I think, you know, I would always say, you know, from a quality assurance perspective, if you wait until the end, you're probably going to be disappointed with the results. Um, if you can build it into your process and your planning, even if you know that some of your, your results are possibly a greater risk uh, from a data integrity perspective than others, then can you, can you bring forward some of these checks earlier on into your research so that you can learn from it when you're actually conducting uh, the research itself? So I think that's a good point, because by focusing on, you know, given that in academia, we have historically focused on the very end product, the journal article, mm -hmm. focusing on data and code is moving things further back down into the process, but it's still not really the process of research itself. These are still mm -hmm. outputs, albeit intermediate outputs, mm -hmm. um, which leads to my next question. I'm looking for hands that go up and questions in the chat. So please do chip in if you have any other thoughts, but maybe for the, the other speakers, what are your thoughts on how this could shift incentives in other words um does the mere fact that checks exist lead to positive change could it lead to unintended consequences is there any scope for gaming these things in a way that wouldn't ultimately lead to any positive change it would just mean that things pass the checks um i don't know if any of the uh, other speakers have any thoughts on that So from my perspective, with the spot checks, uh, what has been raised previously is that um, it's unlikely to be senior PIs who are facing the additional workload that our spot checks will, uh, will incur. And so the additional stress is likely to flow down to people on insecure contracts, and they'll be asked to do more with less time. And so that's a that's a real a real concern. Um, I don't have a solution to that. Something that we need to be aware of. And I think we do need to, um, you know, slow science. You know, we need, we need to to acknowledge that these things to do things properly takes a bit longer, uh, and we should probably be doing less, but but doing it better. Yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a, a helpful perspective. Um, Rennie, Daniel, do you have any any thoughts on that? I I do. So especially on the uh, point about gaming the checks and just passing them that really worries me because i'm putting my name on those reports so i need to be very very careful and make sure i understand what's going on so when someone says that they've shared the raw data i need to be able to evaluate if that data is really the raw data or something has happened to it already uh, so yeah that is something i'm, I'm personally very horrified of <laughs> just me messing something up and missing something that was unintentionally not described properly. So that leads me to very, very, too, probably too carefully going through all of the stuff that is not required for the reproducibility check, just to make sure I understand the materials, I understand what the data, what, how the data would come out from the thing that the people are doing, so that I know what's raw data, what's pre-processed data, and all of that. Um, just to, to pick up on that point about uh, the, the people that end up actually doing the work, um, yeah, I, I mean, that that's how our pilot project is running, but it was designed in that way um, as essentially a way of getting more money to PhD students. <laughs> so, um, 
at the moment, uh, there's the cost of living crisis happening and stipends have gone up a bit, but probably not enough. And so part of my motivation for applying for that funding was that I could give it to some PhD students in return uh, for their help with this project. Um, so I think, yes, OK, that's probably true that it, it will end up being people lower down the food chain than wealthy, successful PIs that actually do the work. But there could also be opportunities there to uh, financially support people at earlier stages of their careers. Uh, and, and it could be in some instances, as we've touched on, it could be that this is a job. Um, so doing all of this stuff could be a funded job. Um, that, that somebody gets um, and that's probably a good thing I think rather than a bad thing so but yeah I, th I think that's definitely something we should bear in mind. Thanks uh, all of you for those comments I might come back to that point I had a couple of thoughts on that myself but um, Etienne has his hand up so Etienne let's come to you. Um, hi everyone thank you very much for the talks it was really really interesting um, I am an associate professor in Reading in a school of psychology um, and just like Dan, um, I am I have the the unusual um, uh, sort of dual background. I, I'm a software engineer by training, and so all everything you spoke about, you know, echoes in my head. And that's actually, I think, one of the reasons why I got into reproducibility because I I, I knew that computers um, can mess up, and I knew why. And so this is why I probably I, I was interested in it sort of resonated. Um, the main uh, um, I, unfortunately, even if I have this background and I'm, I'm in the school of psychology, I'm also a software engineer, I don't have a solution. Um, and um, I think I'm not quite sure how to um, conceptualize things in a way that um, I can then transmit to people. And so the main thing I want to um, ask or, or comment on is, um, is related to the sustainability of, of the whole approach. Um, that uh, it relies on the training of users, basically. On, on and I, by users, I mean researchers, PhDs, MSc students, or or anyone else. Um, I'm teaching statistics of fMRI analysis um, uh, in a very high end um, Python, very low level computing um, type of um, framework. So, uh, so I have, I, 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 I'm sure I share the pain of some of you trying to teach coding to psychologists who have carefully crafted uh, a path around anything math related or anything computer related. And so um, what is your solution? What, what is your experience? And how do we, how do we do move, move forward? Because I think it, that's the only way we can make this um, sustainable. Fiona, do you want to come in on that one? I, I would just say, as someone who spent a lot of time avoiding um, statistics, I can really relate to what Etienne's saying here. Uh, making this process friendly for people, I think, is, is one of those big barriers. And in terms of quality culture, uh, it's what we want to do is we want to demystify what we're doing um, to make it open so that everyone feels that they can contribute. So, you know, I, I for one, would like to know much more about the methodology of, of these computational checks um, because I think if we de demystify it for people, um, you know, welcome them into, into the space, then we're going to have a much bigger uptake. Yeah, I think making this user friendly, making this light touch, making it good enough rather than perfect, which is a point that Fiona made in, uh, in her presentation, I think is going to be really important because a large number of people adopting a, a, an OK system is going to have more of an effect ultimately than three people adopting a perfect system. Um, so we do we do need to strike the right balance, I think. And there is a, a large element of culture change here. Research culture is obviously a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, and we need to think about how to move people from a position where they find this quite threatening, which I think is likely to be the case in many cases at the moment, to something that they feel is actually of benefit to them because it drives up their own standards and the quality of their own work. And that's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take uh, a theory of change so that we can understand the process of getting from one place to the other. Um, and I think it will take a certain amount of discomfort en route in some cases. Uh, there is also obviously the potential for um, this kind of approach to identify fraud. I, I like to think and hope that that is relatively rare, um, but we don't really know because we've never really looked systematically, I don't think. Um, so approaches like this could certainly help in that context. I want to come back to that point about how we resource this though. Um, I think there are real dangers with, for example, um, 
asking PhD students to do this work, there are clear benefits to them as well in terms of the, uh, the um, financial rewards that you could offer for doing that. And that's that's great in the current context, as Daniel alluded to. But there would need to be some careful protections and anonymity so that uh, um, you know some of those sensitivities didn't come back to the people who had just run the um, run the analyses or the checks. Um, so there is this question of whether or not this would be an attractive career path. And I don't know if any of the speakers, perhaps particularly Rennie, because you're still uh, relatively early on in your career, whether this as a role would be something that, you know, with, with yes. career progression and so on, um, you know, would this be an attractive I want to do this. I want to do this. I, I enjoy doing it. I think it's great. It has the potential to be uh, to be actually transformational in how things are done and it improves science. And I don't mind signing my my reports and getting people to dislike me for a little bit while eventually they start to like me again because I've helped them do something better. So I, it definitely suits my personality and desire to just run cold and not write papers. I think that's really interesting. I mean, that, that's my sense from talking to some early career researchers. Um, I'll come to the other panelists in a moment, particularly Daniel and, and Mark, who are currently in academia. Again, Fiona's a, a recent arrival. Um, whether they've heard similar things. But I think if there could be sort of core funded um, posts on open-ended contracts that uh, had scope for uh, career progression built into them, uh, up to more senior levels where you have oversight of multiple schools and faculties, for example, you could envisage what that might look like with research software engineer communities built into that and so on. Um, it would take a certain amount of resourcing, but if we could make the case for why there would be a substantial return on that investment, then universities might be convinced to to give it a go and actually that's part of the pilot that we're running at Bristol that Fiona's leading on will be um, recruiting a, a role very like that uh, probably in the autumn well the advert will go out in the, in the next couple of months I think um, partly to see whether or not there is an appetite for this kind of uh, career path but Mark Daniel do you have any thoughts on on that from an academic perspective go on Mark um, so I, I do, um, as a former clinical trial statistician, we did this routinely. There was always sort of double coding. You, you check someone else's work. Um, I think there's a huge role for analysts in those sorts of settings who typically are not the PI on a grant uh, to be the PI on a reproducibility grant. So it would be small pots of money, but they would be the lead. They would be the one delivering a report at the end, um, like Rennie is doing. And, and I think, you know, that would be that would be that there that would be that that would be contributing to to science yeah i i think i mean i agree with everything you said there marcus about the importance of this being a career path which has scope for progression so i think we train a lot of people uh, we have a lot of people who complete phds they don't all want to become uh, traditional pis they don't all want to become academics a lot of them want to carry on doing research at the coalface in various capacities and this will be a really useful thing but only if it were something that was a secure role uh, that had scope for progression and feeling like you're going somewhere I don't think it would work if it were on uh, insecure sort of soft money contracts for a fixed period of time and you just sort of do it for two years and then and then you think well what, what do I do now um I, I so I think it will be something that would need to be supported structurally at an institutional level or perhaps by um the research committee the, the research councils or UKRI or something like that um yeah and I think that's the kind of thing that we to some extent already do in our support for technician roles so certainly at Bristol and I think it's true at other universities a percentage of grants is sort of top sliced to support um technicians that float across multiple projects. This essentially is that. Of course, there's an ongoing conversation about how we can create good career pathways for technicians. So that's, it's not like that's a perfect solution at the moment, but the funding for that type of role can be generated through that approach. So in that, in some respect, the, uh, the solution exists. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. I'm not seeing any other hands up. That's been a really fascinating discussion. I'd just like to, um, Thank the panelists again, in particular, for their contributions. Those were really interesting talks, and this will be a um, an evolving space, I think, as we start to see what works and what doesn't work, the uh, different pros and cons of different approaches, and um, hopefully, in due course, there will be positive outcomes in terms of a model or a series of um, models or a, a menu of models that uh, institutions can begin to adopt. And in particular, hopefully, we'll also see evidence of the impact that this has 
on the quality of outputs, because ultimately we don't want to be doing this if it's not making a difference. And we need to be checking that it is making a difference. But uh, I think this has been uh, a great introduction to the concepts and uh, hopefully has given people some food for thought. Please do feel free to um, follow up if you have any questions. If you're at an institution that is not taking part in our pilot or would like and would like to join, let us know. If you're doing something similar yourself and would like to join and share what you're doing, then also be in touch. Uh, and I'm sure the speakers themselves will be happy to field individual questions by email um, if, uh, if you have any. But um, all that is left is for me to say thank you, all of you for coming. Um, and also to Neil for uh, running the show in the background um, in the absence of Will. So I hope you have a good rest of your day and uh, see you all again. Thank you.